This podcast is brought to you from our friends at Tincata Protective Fabrics, Emergency Networking, Magna Grip, and IFSTA. All right, welcome to this edition of Firefighting Fridays. I'm Jeff Diedrich with Strategic Fire Training. And uh, this episode, we have Jeff Shoup, Jerry Knapp, John Mateer, and Chad Gruber, and myself. And we're going to be going over uh, one of Jeff's more popular presentations here. Uh, 25 operating tips for the engine companies. Uh, it's been a widely received uh, class over the years. Um, obviously, an accumulation of Jeff's experience-based information, and uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Uh, Jeff, go ahead and get us started. Start off here. Okay. Let me add add to what you just said about the experience based information. I also draw some of this from some of the fire services leading authors of their time, and one of them was Emmanuel Freed, and the other one was uh, Harold Richmond and uh, a few other people out there uh, who, who should get credit also, as they have published their books many, many years ago and had some great stuff that uh, applied to engine operations, fire attack, and things like that. And again, with my own background and so forth and what I saw over time, this is how they kind of evolved or came actually came together and they've evolved since that time. So, all righty. So I'd like to give credit where it's due and uh, let's go. So you want me to handle that, Jeff, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think, we'll, uh, I think what we'll do, Jeff, is as you go through the slides, uh, those of us on the panel, we can uh, either hit you with questions or, all right. Add a statement or comment as you're going and kind of spur off in that way. Okay. Listen, what we're going to cover here is 25 operating tips for engines. It's not everything about engines because what you see here in this uh, photo right here, this is a flammable liquids training we were doing uh, many years ago out in the Mahoning County area. And you see one dumpster there burning pretty good, but actually there was a couple of dumpsters around there. It's because of the amount of uh, fire uh, and then the brightness of it that you don't see the other containers and so forth. And what we were doing was uh, an engine operation, and that was applying foam. And to get started, this was a great learning experience right here if you're going to be dealing with uh, flammable liquids and so forth and setting your foam uh, you know, production, setting it up, and, and, then, and then applying it. And uh, it, it was uh, one of those things where we actually saw one dumpster was extinguished, but the other one was not. And when the guys were hitting it, they actually pushed the fire back over to the dumpster that had been extinguished. And then the other thing we picked up was that when you have something like foam coming into a flammable liquid that's burning, as the weight of that foam uh, hits the surface of the burning liquid, it's going to move it. So that's a thing about safety and positioning of firefighters whenever you have a fire like this in your communities where you don't put your firefighters in harm's way. Because those those flammable liquids, once they escape their container, they take whatever shape or form or whatever after they get uh, after they escape those uh, containers out there. So, anyways, okay, I'll uh, let it go. All right, so we'll go on to the next one. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, the first one is engine companies function as a team with a mission and that is to get water on the fire and this is something uh, that I, I would like to see you know throughout the fire service and that is understanding that there's priorities on the fire ground and we're, if we're talking fires and there's an actual fire your engine's first on the scene in most cases its job is going to be to get water in the fire especially if it's a structure or or something of that nature and the group working that engine needs to understand that it's a, uh, a team effort to get things going. 
And sometimes I know the staffing isn't there. You know, a uh, gentleman I was talking to last night for some time, you know, comes from a fire department, a big city up in Canada. And he was saying they have four and sometimes five people on an engine in his department. I thought, wow, that's pretty good. But in many cases, you see fire departments with three people or two people. Sometimes you see a, an engine going out to fire out of the firehouse with one person driving it to the driving it to the scene or to the location anyhow. So that's that's a tough thing uh, to overcome that that uh, number of personnel. But nevertheless, it's what you got to do if you're there by yourself. So, but anyways, yeah, that's uh, you, number you've one. Said in the past many times, Jeff, firefighting is a numbers game. You need people to do the job, and that's where the teamwork comes in. Absolutely. And so if you're on a department that's going, or if you're running a department, let's say you're an officer, a chief officer, or what have you, and you know you're only going to get three people on your engines, then don't set them up to be complicated. And we've said that when we've gone out many times, you know, when we go across the country, we talk about keeping your firefighting simple. And really, that's something I think that applies no matter if you got two or three people on an engine or four or five people on an engine. So just keep your firefighting simple because that's the way you're going to get water in the fire quickly. So, okay. Guys, you there? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Let's see the okay. Next one. All right. I got this one. Uh, this, I'm going to give Harold Richmond credit for this one. The engine company is the most basic unit for fire extinguishment in the fire service. Every member of every fire department should be thoroughly trained to perform the basic operations required of an engine company. And what this should mean is that everyone comes into the fire service as a probationary, a rookie, a cadet, a candidate, uh, a new kid, or whatever you want to call them, okay, whatever their title is. It's during that time that we start building the teams of the future for firefighting. And that is understanding that, the, well, like we said, engine company operations is a team approach. And you learn this over time was that you have different positions on an engine to cover. You know, for example, you have your company officer position, then you have your driver and if you want to call them your operator, your engineer, or your MPO, I don't care. But that's another position. And then the third position, if you have uh, three members on that engine, well, then that person should be the nozzle, the person on the nozzle. If you are on a department where the, you see those positions rotating, that doesn't mean you should not know what that position does or is responsible for. You know, for example, if you're a volunteer and you're working with different members on each call, and so one day you might be driving, another day you might be in the back step, you know, as we say, you know, you might be in the nozzle, someday you might be the backup person. One call you might be the senior firefighter or the boss of that company when it goes out the door. So like we say here, Every member of every fire department should be thoroughly trained to perform the basic operations required of an engine company. And I got to tell you, and John, you can back me up on this. We know both, both of us come from a large operation that you're going to have guys who are going to rotate through different positions on that engine. Another thing too, is when you get people detailed into your company or overtime on your company, or you have acting officers. So you see there's different uh, positions that you might hold while working on an engine, but you got to know them for that engine company to do its job. Okay. So there's got to be a plan in effect. All right. I want to, I want to make that point also. There's got to be a plan like SOPs or SOGs regulations or whatever you want to call them. All right. Like it. Yep. Okay. Number two, don't block access to the fire building with poor apparatus placement. Can you guys see me okay? Or I got blue eyes, things like that, right? You're fine. Okay, good. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip. 
the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit magnagrip.com. Don't block access to the fire building with poor apparatus placement. Remember, trucks get the building. That's something that was given to me as a youngster when I was first coming into the fire service. You know, trucks get the building. The trucks, they got the tools, they got the ladders, they got the aerial devices and so forth. The building should belong to them. That means your engines get out of the way, let the trucks come in. And let's move to the next slide right here. Here's a picture, you know, of, of a fire that, you know, from our fire department, John and I. And you see the trucks, you know, like in this case, it's a rear mount uh, tower ladder. And they had to get into this building to set up for their uh, placement of their turntable. And that's another thing about trucks that, you know, every everyone should know is that, you know, it's turntable placement uh, for many uh, positions. In the background, you see an aerial ladder going to the roof. So you don't want engines to block the trucks from getting into the buildings. And you see the ground ladders that are thrown there. You see the aerial to the roof and, and, and things like that, you know. And uh, we can always put an extra uh, section of hose into the stretch if we got to get the engines out of the way so the trucks can get into the building, okay? So, all right. Yes, How are we doing? Okay, good. Good. All Thank right. You. Okay. Here's, uh, and again, these are the principles. When we put this material out there, and I'm proud of our group because we all say the same thing. And it's fun when you go to a different part of the country and you get to see the same thing that you've been talking about already being done. It's kind of like, yep, yep, they understand it too. This is, uh, Jerry, this is back in 2005, I think it was, when we were out in L.A. Mm -hmm. yep. And we were over there at their one training center, and this, uh, this fire came in. And, oh, my God, it was hysterical. You know, we jumped in all our vans, and we're driving through the streets. You know, we're following this big column of smoke going up in the air. And the police in L.A. had the whole area cordoned off. And... Uh, the doors of the vans just popped open. It was like like the clown wagon at the circus. There's all these guys running down the streets now to get in to see this fire. But that picture is tremendous because there you see three tractor-drawn aerials in front of the fire building. And then again, there's your ground ladders going up also. And again, they had a great, uh, great apparatus placement at this fire right here. So, But uh, yeah, trucks should get the building, okay? So one of the things you got to work on, one of the things you got to work on, and, you know, and, and officers, if you're an officer on an engine, it's a, it's, it should be up to you and that driver to know if that truck isn't coming in behind you and it's coming towards you, you might have to stop your engine short so you can get that truck or allow that truck to get into the fire building. And of course, if your engine's going to be early on and they're going to be stretching, well, see, now you got a, a stretching concern. And that's another reason why we said earlier, you know, keep your system simple just for those types of situations. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. All right. Okay. Number three, if an engine is responding from a station with a truck company and another engine is first due, maybe the truck should lead the response. What do you think about that? That one, I'm all right. I was gonna say, I'm all right with that. Or you let the uh, if the engines first on the street, they pull over and let the truck pass them. You know, they park further down the street and leave the front of the house for the truck. Yeah, yeah, okay. Here we go. Guys, what is what, what that you, one's kind of hard? That one's hard to get your guys to do. So, what when I was at the big station where we had a truck and an engine together, um, if we were going to the other district then yes, I would let them go first, but my guys wanted to beat them out of the house so bad. So I finally said, yeah, we can beat them, pull out onto the tarmac, but let the truck go first if we're going to district two, because you're here to win the war, not the battle. You know, and I, the best ch chance we have is that truck needs to be there before the engine. 
I think that's another thing about knowing your district and knowing what type of aerial apparatus or you know, device that you're responding with. Chad, you just took off of me. I was going to ask you, I think you've got a Sutphin Tower, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And in that case, the turntable's located right behind a cab. Yes, sir. Whereas you get rear mounts, well, now you got about 40 or 45 feet behind the cab where the turntable is. So, yes, again, yeah, you got to make sure those engines get out of the way. And, John, now yeah, that's a good point about, you know, if the engine is going to lead the way and you got a truck coming behind you, you got to get over when you get close to the fire. Get over, get out of the way. And for the sake of safety, the officers and that engine that's pulling over out of the way and that truck got to communicate that. Because if you just say, well, we're pulling over here, tell your driver to pull over, that truck doesn't know what you're doing. And people can be confused also, you know, in their cars and so forth. So really, and that's why we always say, you know, when you're responding, get on those tactical channels and know who you're responding with. So pay attention and, and, and uh, you know, Make sure those communications are made. So, all right. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. Yes, sir. Okay. This is all about simplicity right here. Number four, attack host should be loaded with the male couplings out and the nozzle attached. That's it. That's it. That's simple. Attack hose. We're not talking about anything else. Attack hose should be loaded with the male couplings out and the nozzle attached. You see so many things out there nowadays. You know, you see all kinds of uh, devices, you know, and extreme pipe lengths and things like that and so forth. And one of our old friends uh, made it, made it, made a point a long time ago. And I remember it that he likes a compact nozzle. I thought, yeah, that does make sense. You want a nozzle that's simple to operate, whether you have the, the bail and whether you have a fog tip or solid bore, I don't care, but you want a nice compact nozzle. And we've seen things like stream shapers put on our, our attack lines for inch and three-quarter lines. Now, a stream shaper is for what? You know, what's it doing? You know, you're going to bash that stream apart, that inch and three-quarter hose line, in the next eight or 10 or 12 feet when you get inside that building and start working it around, right? So what good is a stream shaper except that it might clog up your nozzle? And if you have a fog tip with a stream shaper behind it, then you get your your bail. Yeah, I, I think it's counterproductive. Okay, so so anyway, keep it simple. Keep it simple. All right. Uh, one of the other things about your attack hose being loaded that way, your last fifty feet loaded on should be your working length if you're using that type of a hose load. And uh, again, the nozzle person on the nozzle takes the nozzle in one hand, takes the loops on the other forearm, or sometimes guys put them on their shoulder. I don't think it matters. All right. Uh, but that's the working length that goes with the nozzle. And when you go to the drop point, the drop point, and we'll discuss that later on in this uh, 25 tips, is where we get as close to the fire as we possibly can and put the line in service with the call for water. So, all righty. We okay? Yes, sir. All right. There we go. Use a big enough and long enough hose line. You guys are going to help me out on this one. How many times have we gone out and worked with fire departments that have no idea about static beds, don't have any static beds, everything's a pre-connect? It's a 150. Most of America. <laughs> yeah, and, and I say that. I just don't understand because when you see some of these people trying to stretch, you know, the other thing 
where they try to stretch a, uh, an inch and three quarter hose like we're talking about here, 400 or 500 feet, well, the efficiency is lost because of friction loss over the length of that line. So if you think you're going to get the water that you would get at a 200 foot stretch, it's not going to happen. But the point about this slide right here, use a big enough and long enough hose line. And remember, inch and three quarter, sadly, became the go-to line for just about uh, many fires in many fire departments. And it's, you know, you have a building that's heavily involved. John, we've seen that, you know, you got a building that's heavily involved or completely involved and you see the inch and three quarter coming out of the bed. All this, you see it all the time. And even when you talk to guys about it, they, you know, when you ask them, what would you pull? They're like, Oh, the inch and three quarter, the inch and three quarter. It's all they really think about. They never really think about the other, um, the other yeah. options we have on our pumpers. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what does number five say? Use a big enough and long enough hose line. So, Jeff, got anything to add? Yes, yeah, so it's important, I think, if you're on this learning curve, is to understand that inch and three quarter uh, is very capable for most things, but it's matched to the fire, not necessarily to the building. And I can give you an example. Uh, you have a... You have a a smaller maybe car fire at a uh, at a dealership or at a maintenance shop and it's essentially a car fire so pull the inch and three quarter and put it out it's during the day it was reported you're on scene within a few minutes yeah same yeah. kind of incident after hours somebody's reporting smoke coming from that same shop that's probably a two and a half inch fire yeah if it's later in the night and someone's reporting fire through the roof you need a ram or a master stream on that same fire <laughs> so you got to yeah, kind of yeah. take it all into a context of where which line works and where it works yeah ifsta is dedicated to updating firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals apps curriculum resource one and more our high quality technically accurate and affordable training and education materials have made us a worldwide leader of the fire service visit us at ifsta.org for more information. Okay, Jerry. Uh, Jeff, I, it's a really good point. I always say the engine company's mission is to deliver decisive amounts of water. So just like Jeff was saying, you know, when you pull up, you do your size up, you want to deliver a decisive amount of water and overcome this fire and not make it a fair fight. So pick the big line for a big fire. And like you said, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Yep. Okay. My my last learning curve one I'll tell you is uh, an old timer told me when I was a kid asking these questions, how do you know which hose to pull? His his street sense was more like this. If if that fire is in the house, if it's in two or more areas, meaning two or more floors or the second floor and the attic, it's like pull the two and a half. He goes, you're better off with the reach and the penetration. Uh, you could put out a lot more fire from a further distance away with that two and a half than, than you could the inch and three quarter. And I've kind of carried that in into my years um, and kept, always kept that in mind. I think it's a safe play. But uh, obviously situations are circumstantial, but yeah. not a bad uh, rule of thumb. If that fire is in two, and a, two or more areas, grab the two and a half. Yeah. Chad, what do you think? Uh, I like it. I think, you know, you can never really have too much water. So if you're in doubt, take the bigger hose line. I always tell guys at the station, I go, look, it's like cooking dinner for the fire station. What happens if you don't get enough food? I'd rather make way too much more food and have leftovers than not enough to feed everybody. Same thing with this. You know, an inch and three quarters is good, like Jeff said, on a room and contents fire. But if there's any doubt, it doesn't hurt to take the bigger line. Take the two and a half. If it's if you if you get in there, it's not that bad. Extend off of it. You can make a two and a half a smaller line, but always take enough water with you when you go in. Yeah. I got a friend of mine, Captain Chris Flatley from FDNY. He goes, "How do you make a two and a half flow uh, 180 gallons a minute?" I'm like, "Geez, I don't know. I don't know, Chris." He goes, "You shut it off after 30 seconds." So. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd like to say we could take probably uh, most of these or all of these topics, you know, the, the numbered uh, statements and break them down into more detail. For example, you know, we talk about that two and a half. A lot of people are afraid of the two and a half because they say they can't handle it. And I'll bet you in most cases they're over pumped two and a half. So it's a low pressure hose. Line. Yeah. That's what they, it is. They think they can't handle it or they haven't ever handled it. Unfortunately. You well, got to go on. Jeff, you know, on our department, I mean, I'll speak when I got hired. I mean, I was taught to pump at 125 for everything. For everything. Didn't matter the nozzle type. It didn't matter the hose size. It was 125. And, you know, knowing what we know, it's yeah. a pretty bad idea, especially if you have a two and a half. Right? That's, that's pretty difficult to hold it at 125 yeah. or 150. I've tried that before. That doesn't work very well either. Yeah. Uh, an old, our old friend, Dave McGrail, you know, made a good point one time. He says, if you have 200 feet of two and a half laid out and you're pumping about on a hundred, you're over pumping it. That really should be about 70 or 75 pounds. And he, he was, you know, making a good point there about that. Once again, it's a low pressure line. So yeah, guys get uh, whipped around. And so they gravitate towards that inch and three quarter hose line for a fire that really it borders on deck gun usage. You know, and when you have a small hose line delivering a small volume of water and it puts you closer to the building that's heavily involved or completely involved, that's not a good thing either. So, anyways, okay. All right, ready? Let's move on. Big fires require big flow apply in a big way. And this just goes hand in hand with what we've been talking about, okay? You know, when, when you when you hear someone say, you know, oh, we'll never use the deck gun, you know, oh my gosh, no, no, that's that doesn't apply to us. Yeah, we're we're interior firefighters all the time. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, no. You're gonna have those fires that are you should be using that deck gun. Big fire, big flow, apply in a big way. And apply applying in a big way doesn't mean you surround a building that's completely involved in fire with inch and three quarter hose lines. That's not big flow. Okay. Sorry. That's uh, not, it's not an aggregate number that we put together. It's how to do, put together the big stream with the knockout punch. Right, Jerry? Okay. Okay. Jeff, anything? I would just add that uh, these big fires, like the ones in the pictures here, I mean, they will burn for days sometimes and, they will burn down to the level of firefighting that you're applying. So the bigger the water you're throwing, it may shave off a half a day of firefighting <laughs> on these big fires if you're actually throwing the right amount of water, that, which is all the water that you can throw. So if you can get three 1,000 gallon per minute master streams going around a building, uh, eventually that fire uh, will be caught up by that amount of water. So you just, you got to throw what you got in the ground and yeah. get it into the fire. Yeah. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tencatafabrics.com slash flex7. Flex7, powered by Enforced Technology, only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. You had that fire over at the uh, foundry in Oakwood, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, what, yeah. February this year? Yeah. That multi-alarm fire there. Yeah. And, it, you know, we... We were the initial engine to uh, get uh, water going on one side of that building. And uh, yeah, we started with the deck gun and we went to the ram and then we supplemented with the, uh, the uh, ground monitor, which we, we take the deck gun off, put it on the base, feed it with a four inch line. So yeah, that was a master stream fire. And then, you know, eventually we caught up to it and then we 
connected uh, a hand line to the RAM and we went in and mopped up. Yeah. So that's the way it works. Yep. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> okay. All righty. Let's move on. Number seven, don't crowd the nozzle. Space yourselves approximately five feet apart on a hose line. From the time I was a new kid coming into job and watching seven, eight, nine guys laying in the hallway, the lines going up the stairs, the guys at the top of the stairs, and it was like everyone's crowding the person on the nozzle. And in some cases, they're actually pushing the nozzle, the person on the nozzle, up into the fire area. You know, if you got to like, let, let me just illustrate it this way. So let's say you got a double decker and you got an upstairs fire and it's roaring pretty good. Out, coming out a couple of windows on arrival. So once again, here goes the inch and three quarter line up the stairways and person on the nozzle is up at the top of the stairs. And now you have these other members coming in behind. They don't feel the heat. They're not up there in that uh, environment with the, the guy in the nozzle and they're all pushing from behind. Get up there, get up there, move up there. Come on, let's get in. And next thing you know, the guy in the nozzle is getting burned because he's getting pushed into the fire. Another thing is what if the nozzle isn't delivering that good amount of water that it should, like we talked about. Okay. Maybe the pumper isn't pumping at the right pressure. Maybe there's a kink in the hose line, you know, something like that. And now you got this guy, you know, getting uh, getting nailed. He's in the jackpot right now. So give the person in the nozzle room to operate, okay? It's just that simple, okay? All right? Yep. Okay. Number eight, make the hose line straight. And again, five to 10 feet behind the person in the nozzle to avoid kinking and whipping. This is interesting. Guys, you're gonna, I'm going to ask you to chime in on this one because as we in our group are pushing low-pressure, high-volume fire attack and there's departments out there that want to go that way, but they don't want to buy everything at once. They want to want to buy the hose that's matched to the nozzles and the low-pressure and understand that. Well, you know what happens with that hose, right? You know how... Next thing you know, they got a hose that wants to whip or kink or right at the right at the uh, right behind the nozzle. John, you know, you you've uh, you've seen that with us with me a couple of times, you know, and uh, that's why we need to keep the line straight because once we start bending that line, especially if it's not matched to that that attack package, you might get whacked. So okay, so anybody. Anybody? Yeah, I was, I was thinking that, if, you know, making every effort to keep that hose line straight behind the nozzle to avoid kinking and whipping uh, and making sure that, that that line goes straight down to the floor and, and keeping that line on the floor will help minimize that back pressure that yeah. the uh, nozzle man is experiencing. So it helps, <clears throat> it helps with the, uh, the technique that the nozzle man is using to keep that nozzle point in the direction he needs it. Let me ask you this. Are people being taught to lay on a line in the, in the flat or the hallway? Do we see that being taught anymore? Or are we all, you know, I, I ran into one, uh, one training fire. We're doing live burn training over in Portage County. John, you came there, Jeff, you were there with me yeah. several years yeah. ago. And when I watched this young firefighter, we're going in. We got a, uh, I would say, a, a, a decent fire going in this back room here, and it's it's a bit black and it's hot. You know, it's coming down. Next thing you know, the it's starting to whip overhead. This young firefighter standing up, and I grabbed him and pulled him down to the floor, and he couldn't understand what I had done to him. So let me ask you, you know, how does that happen? That this kid was setting himself up for disaster for some serious burns. And are we not teaching the proper way to hold the nozzle or the hose line by laying on it? We showed on the stairways, you know, how we can pin the hose to the outer part of the stair tread against the stair stringers or against the wall. 
But how about in that hallway and and so and uh, you know? Tell I, me th- I think that overall the the nozzle mechanics is something that is not or has not been really trained or passed down. I think there is a lot of assumptions in the fire service, and one of them is here's the nozzle, kid. Open it if you want water, and that's about it. There's not a lot of uh, body mechanics or you know demonstration done. Yeah. I think one of the things we see a lot, Jeff, is that they don't understand nozzle reaction. So if you have a an inch and three quarter flowing 180 gallons a minute, there's 69 pounds of, of nozzle reaction pushing back against that line. And like you said, if the nozzle mechanics aren't right, um, and in this case, we're talking about keeping the hose line straight. Why keep the hose line straight? Well, if we keep it straight, that nozzle reaction goes into the floor of the ground, right? Um but if we bent, try to bend that nozzle around the corner, what happens to the nozzle reaction? Now it's it's at 90 degrees to the nozzleman, and it, it pretty much almost always pushes them over. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we talk about mechanics and the, the science of it. But that's that's something that they need to understand. And I think Jeff D. made a good point that the backup man, we see it all the time in the Northeast, the backup man wants to pick the line up. Cause that's yeah. comfortable for him. You know, it's yeah. great for him and he doesn't understand it, what he's doing to the, to the nozzle man. So uh, that the detail devils in the details, you know, that, that um, I, I think to, to Jeff's point that this information is not getting out. Hopefully like we, we show it in our, our program all the time and guys get to experience it and before we were talking about the two and a half. Right. And why don't we pull a two and a half? Cause like, man, I don't know if I can hold that. It's going to get away from me. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have the right nozzle mechanics, like when we're doing our class, uh, Jeff Shoup always tells guys, "One, one we'll, we'll show you how one person can hold a two and a half. And if you look at the, the students' faces, they're like, oh, my God, I can't do that. And you show them the right technique, and they're like, oh, yeah, I did that. And and it's you, you just got to understand the, the mechanics. I, I, don't, I don't think we do a good job of – I mean, we know what nozzle mechanics means, but – I don't think it means a lot to other people until we show it to them. And then they're like, Oh yeah, I got it. You know, right, it's cr- right. critical, critical skills. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I think there's more nozzle mechanics out there now than there has ever been. I don't think firefighters learn it good in the academies because they teach out of a certain curriculum. And unless you're doing a department run Academy, that you can dive into it and make sure they have it. But with all the conferences, FDIC that's popped up, there is more training now than there ever has been in the fire service. And, you know, I mean, I think we still have a lot of work to do. And on the nozzle mechanics, if you're going to start doing it, make sure you start small. You know, uh, a mistake you make with an inch and three quarter is not as big as a mistake you make with a two and a half. It, as the water goes up, your your uh, potential for – it'll show what weakness you have if you're on the bigger hose lines. John? Um, I was going to mention you were asking for teaching laying on it. I'm not really teaching laying on the hose, but, you know, obviously I'm teaching what we teach um, to our academy classes. And – just a few days ago, we had one of the one of the cadets from a recent class. Um, my understanding is he was standing up too too high, and he ended up getting burned, just like that guy that you were talking about that that training burn. But it was a real burn. They're not taught that, but I think they're adrenaline, especially when they don't have a lot of experience um, at real fires yet. Their their adrenaline gets going. They they do things that, you know, they weren't taught to do, but, you know, question. instinctually they, what was, was that? On, I got a question. Was he on the nozzle? Yeah. Where was his boss? Uh, right behind him. Okay. And? My understanding is he stood up and he shouldn't have been standing. Yeah. But um, I don't really know all the details on that, but uh, that was the brief notes I got from his boss that day. Hmm. Um, it, it don't take it don't take long if you're standing up in black fire, catch yeah. your burn. No, yeah, it gets hot really quick. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. 
All right, what else you got for us, Jeff? Number nine? Uh, yeah, we got a number nine. There's one way, one way to get a hose line into a fire building, and here's a couple others right there. Not only do we stretch it in, but you got the ladders, and you got those uh, ropes. With the rope, it's very simple. Clove hitch and a half hitch. All you do is put in a bunch of half hitches together, and that's how you tie off a line. And it's preferable, like you see here, to, to hoist a dry line, isn't it? Rather than one that's filled with water. Yeah. A little lighter. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyways, yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Okay. There's that LA fire once again. And this is in regards to ladders and to ropes. And I was really, uh, when we were watching this fire, you know, they hoisted four hose lines up the side of the building there, as you can see, up to that fire area. It was like boom, boom, boom. From a strategic and tactical standpoint, and this is one of the things that you know we do. We make sure that we uh, have the students do this when we do our class. At least in most cases, we do. I should say, because from a strategic, strategic and tactical standpoint, if you have an occupied building like this was, well, now you get your firefighters in there to do do searches quickly without having to trip over hose lines. If you're evacuating the building, you can, people can evacuate the hallways and the stairways also without having to worry about tripping over hose lines or anything like that. And plus, a straight line of hose going up the side of the building helps to minimize your hose layouts. And so that's, that's a thing right there. Just remember when you're ho hoisting a hose line up the side of a building or up a stairwell, like some uh, times you have to do, you go up through the well hole. Uh, you have to tie it off, okay? Otherwise, it's going to be like electricity. It wants to go right to ground, all right? So, all righty. I like it. Okay. Number 10, support hose couplings to hose lines going up the side of a building. You know, that's kind of a, not something you see in small town USA right there. But nevertheless, if you got to take coupling or take hose lines up the side of a building or up uh, like you saw on the previous slide, you got to secure the couplings, okay? Because that coupling is put together with that hose with an expansion ring, and that's it, okay? So, all right. Number 11, if you're stretching into an, upper, uh, an apartment building for an upper floor fire, use the well hole if it's there to minimize the stretch. And what you're looking at where the light is on, that's the well hole right there. So if you have a well hole, use it. And that's where you take the working length. You know, you can go up to the floor below the floor where the fire is located. Like, for example, if you have a fifth floor fire, you go to the fourth floor, drop the rope down, pull your hose up, and pull up the slack that you're going to need, your extra hose, secure it to the uh, ba uh, banister or the railing, call for your water, and now you're ready to, uh, to go to work. So, all right. Okay, yep. we won't belabor that point. Take the kinks out of the hose lines. Jerry, here you go. Here's your stuff right here. You want to jump in on this one, all the work you've done with uh, flows and kinks and things, so forth? Sure. There was some, there was some um, generalizations out about kinks. The first kink reduces the flow by 20 GPMs. The second kink reduces it by 40 and those kind of things. And they just weren't, they just weren't true. What it really depends on is your fire tax system. It depends on what kind of nozzle you have on the end of your line and, and how bad your kinks are. Um, so we tested smooth bores. We tested um, uh, fog tips and we tested automatic nozzles and the amount of reduction in flow uh, by equal, equally, I'll call them equally bad kinks, really depended on what kind of nozzle. So the low pressure, um, high volume solid bore nozzles had lost less water than did the uh, 100 PSI fog tips or the automatics. Uh, pretty much just a generalization, the uh, solid bores, lost the least amount of water per kink. The um, next in line was the fog tip. 
And then the worst was the automatic nozzles that lost uh, sometimes as much as 50 or 60% of their flow, uh, you know, with an equivalent kink. So, uh, uh, again, it's, you got to get in devils in the details. You, you got to yeah. use your flow meters. You got to use your, uh, your pedos and, and, and play with these and, and really understand, understand kinks. But obviously, as Jeff said, kinks are bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Kinks are bad. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on here. Okay. For the sake of time. Number 13. Once again, it goes along with couplings and flow and eliminating, uh, you know, problems with water loss and things like that. Tighten your couplings. Everybody should have a spanner wrench in their pocket. Okay. Or some kind of tool where they can tighten couplings when necessary. All right. Okay. 14, learn your nozzle's characteristics and how to sound with a stream. Uh, again, this is one of those things that's, you know, you, uh, you you think it's taught to everybody, but when you get out there, you think, no, no. Uh, when you say sounding with the stream, a lot of people think sounding with a stream is is supposed to be in front of you downward. You know, when you, you ever heard uh, that stream when it's slapped against the floor and you hear that pew, pew, yeah. Well, when I hear that happening in rapid succession like that, that's telling me that more water is being played on the floor than in the upper atmospheres where the temperatures are higher. So th th that is not sounding with a stream. That's just testing to see if there's a floor in front of you or something like that. But sounding with a stream is where you're using the stream and the sound it makes to get to the, uh, the ceiling to see if there's something high overhead or you've got a wall nearby or you got storage or whatever type of building you're going into, whatever type of occupancy you got. And I know we've been, uh, you know, when I've done the job, we had a couple instances, probably more than a couple, where we're throwing water into smoke. We're in, we're in there, right? We're thinking, we're, we're kicking ass, you know? <laughs> the roof was gone overhead and we're just throwing water out you know the top of the building you know because it was gone you know, funny we didn't hear it hitting the ceiling did we <laughs> so, yeah uh jeff let me catch you up they call that mapping now water mapping. <laughs> oh okay yeah. okay uh, i know you guys probably had a term for it called sounding with the yeah. stream but now we call it mapping. It's water. Oh, I mapping. see. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. Just want to make bring you into the it makes somebody modern happy. Age, okay. If they understand it, good. But it's something that we've done for a long time. Let's just put it yeah. out there that way. Okay. You know, I think this points out one of the big problems that we're seeing here in the Northeast is that the probationary recruit training or firefighter one or whatever you call it is so jam packed with first aid and hazmat and fire inspections and all this other stuff that there's no time to teach the young firemen, you know, what to listen for. You know, we're, we're cranking guys through and gals and guys and gals through and they get their couple cracks on the nozzle and they get their one live burn and then a pat on the butt and are out in the street. But there isn't time to, to, to go over this stuff. And again, I think it's because we've overcrowded the, the recruit training with all this other stuff. Yeah, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. John uh, or John and Jeff, didn't we talk about this about a year ago about what is it? Uh, Academy classes can be anywhere from 16 to 22 weeks long. And I remember, I, I, I can't remember where, and it doesn't matter. It's not important. Where we were talking to some people, we were out there doing a class some someplace, and they said, we only get like three days of fire attack in this whole 16 to 22-week basic firefighting academy. It's like, well, you're right, Jer, you know. They're not getting it. They're never going to get it because, again, we, we you know, like a – <laughs> Everybody says we got to train, we got to train, we got to train. Well, when these new people get out of the academy and go to their firehouses, if they're not doing any training, they're getting nothing. They've got nothing. And you talked about uh, nozzle mechanics. They'll never acquire them that way. John, you were going to say something? No, I was going to say our academy is 22 weeks. The first 10 weeks are EMS. Jesus and the last, 12, the last 12 weeks are fire. Now, 
they get more than one shot at being on the tip of the live burn. I mean, they yeah. hopefully they get three or four each, but it all depends on the size of the class and the days we have available to do that. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll add to that um, out here in, in the, uh, in a smaller operations where retention and, and recruiting is an issue just like it is for most places, at least up by us, John. Um, yeah. You know, we're doing lateral transfers. We're bringing in people of all different ages and experiences. And there's a lot of assumptions. There's a lot of assumptions happening. Like, okay, you've been on the job for a few years. You're coming in on a lateral. You don't look like a young kid. We're assuming that you'd kind of have an idea of what you're doing, but you know, there's the old trust, but verify, you know, you gotta, yeah. <laughs> gotta put the line in their hand and say, you know, let's, let's throw some water and see, right. what do. You know, and see how it goes. Right. Right. And, and Jeff, they may know, they may have known how to do it their old department's way, but they don't know your department's way. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're right. We make a lot of assumptions and you know, when we find those out, yeah, you don't want yeah. to fire, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ron Gore from Jacksonville, Florida, used to say, if you go up on a roof and, and you put on a bird suit, you put on a bird beak, you better be able to fly if you're going to jump off. And to Dee's point, you know, these guys look like firemen, and maybe they just can't fly. Not their right. fault. They just haven't had, you know. Right. I, I think there's another point here that's a little bit softer, is that I always say the gray hairs and the no hairs need to – we need to – I don't want to say forcefully, but we need to be able to pass on what we've learned. And I think we're doing it through this program, but um, for the, obviously in your own firehouse, nobody wants to hear you. You know, it's, you're just another old guy that needs to get out of the way, but we need to pass on our experience, you know, just like this is sounding. I, I bet you if we, we talk to, you know, uh, the fire service, 70% of them wouldn't, wouldn't know to listen for the nozzle, right. or listen for the water, you know, is it going out the window? Is it going through a hole in the roof? Uh, you know, All right. You know, not yeah. their fault. It, you know, and it can also it can also tell you when there's a door. If yeah. you hear it on a wall, and then all of a sudden you don't, you've got another room to tech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You can throw in the sound of the stream when when we half bail. That smooth bore makes that that characteristic mm-hmm. sound. And if I'm number two on the line as a boss, and I hear that, I know that my nozzle man's doing something. He's either repositioning, getting more hose, or he's moving. It's a cue for me to pay attention more to like, okay, what is going on with the nozzle man? He's half bailing for some reason. Um, so that's another sound with the stream, I think, for me anyways. All right. You're right. Okay. Very good. Okay. Let's move on. Move or lighten up the hose line with the nozzle man's command. Don't push the nozzle man into the fire. How about that? You know, once again, Jeff, you mentioned about the boss reading the person on the nozzle, you know, reading what they're doing, listening for the nozzle. When you have zero visibility and you got smoke and maybe steam coming down on you, you know, hey, you're trying to put two and two together here, right? Uh, we're getting steam. We're hitting something hot. Anyhow, I can't see it, but uh, I'm not going to push this guy at that point. Because if you push it too hard, you might push that nozzle out of that person's hands. And now what do you got? You know, because of that fire lights up around you, behind you or whatever, after you've knocked the, uh, made the initial knock and that nozzle has been pushed out of that uh, person's control. Not a good position, not a good situation. I think uh, with number 15 here, as it states, move, the hose line with the nozzle man's command. I think it's important that fire departments adopt either unofficial or official language here, like uh, command language. Um, it's important, I think, because when you're wearing that mask and you're trying to communicate, you know, more hose sounds pretty different than lighten up or move up or five feet. Yeah. But you got to have that. It's not going to sound that clear, especially the person that you're trying oh, to no. yell it to. So those those that nomenclature needs to be clear and consistent, I think, for uh, an efficient crew working in zero visibility. Grover. Yes, sir. 
What do you got to say? Nothing. Good stuff. <laughs> no. What do you guys do? How do you how do you uh, tell uh, the people behind you it's time for more line? Well, as their officer, I've taught them, you know, what you taught me. Hey, I'm listening for that first cue of that smooth bore shutting down to half. It's where I get that distinctive sound. And, you know, I'm usually three to five feet behind them. And, you know, if they'll say, they'll say moving up or they'll say moving and I'll hear the, <laughs> and then I'll just start moving hose with them. So yeah, we've adopted what y'all taught me. Yeah. Oh, okay. And again, depending on the situation that you're in, are you in a place that has wide open aisle space or a long hallway or whatever? How much do you feed when the person on the nozzle calls for more line? Hey, lighten up, lighten up. Okay, what are you going to give them? You know, three feet like we try to push, you know, especially if you're in a residential type structure, apartment building or something like that, or if you're in a tight area. No, you know, think about the area. One. I was going to say that's where the nozzle mechanics come back in because oh, yeah. if you know, and then you take on the, Hey, you got a swing firefighter that day. You normally work with your crew. You know, does he know that I'm going to roll one and go one as Dietrich always says, but you know, that's where you almost, it's a lot easier when you're with the same guys. You know, I know that if I've got a guy that's not as tall, his, his two pushes aren't going to be near the size of my two pushes. And, uh, you know, it's just knowing your crew and actually having to play with the hose. And I mean, it's like John was saying, and you were saying earlier, if you get somebody, um, coming in on overtime or a sub, it's something that the officer might want to talk about that morning, you know, just to, Hey, if you're riding here, you need to know how we normally operate. You're not my normal guy. Okay. Number 16. If only the person on the nozzle is holding or supporting the hose during attack, then your volume of water is probably less than desirable. Okay. And once again, if this was uh, taken from back in the times, and it hasn't been that long ago, when we were looking at 100 PSI nozzles, you got one person holding a 100 PSI nozzle by themselves and two or three or four people standing around behind them, not helping that person with the hose. Well, you know what they're going to do. They're either going to bail it down part way or they're going to yell back to the pump operator, you know, Hey, cut it down 10 pounds or 15 pounds or whatever, you know, let me hold this thing. When you shut down the, 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 the pressure, then you cl- shut down the volume. You reduce that. And again, that whole thing about like what we've we've hit it on uh, several slides tonight, and that is nozzle mechanics. When you're getting a, a, a feed or where you're getting the line charged from the engine, take a knee, take a knee, and listen to that engine sound. Is it you know uh, operating off uh, hydrant? Uh, supply or is it operating off the water tank and that thing is going to be revved up a little bit or if it's not revved up a little bit that's the other thing about that engine so so anyway yeah if one person's holding the line by themselves during fire attack you know especially standing up probably not getting a good uh, volume of water all right but at least it looks good jeff it looks good for the news at six and eleven it looks good it looks Um, good okay good all right when confronted with high heat and heavy smoke conditions, get down low. Again, this is academy stuff right here. This is when that person leaves the academy and goes out to their uh, engine, if that's what they're working on, that boss or those uh, older firefighters should make sure this is followed. It's just that simple, okay? You get into heavy heat and high smoke condi- or heavy, heavy smoke and high heat conditions, get down low, okay? not up for debate is it no okay good all right gas is igniting at ceiling level that's a preceding sign of rollover and a preceding sign of i'm sorry gas is igniting at ceiling level that's rollover and it's a preceding sign of flashover okay once again 
We've all seen it. We've probably been involved with it. We're moving in. We're moving in. We're moving in, and it's getting hot, and we're going to get in there, and we're going to knock this thing out with our inch and three-quarter line, and you know what? We're in a room that's about 40 by 50, and that fire wants to take off like a blowtorch. Question. You think that small hand line is going to be able to knock that fire down in that big of an area? I'm talking about like a like a like a meeting room or a storage room or something like that where you have especially you know some uh, material stored in there, combustibles and things like that. Your whole room is heating up, and you're taking a small line in there and you're working yourself right in there, and that door that you open behind you is letting that fresh air come in. Bang. Yep, and I think. It's worth noting uh, when this phenomenon is happening, uh, if you're on that attack line and you hear somebody from outside or maybe down the hall and they're hollering, open the line, open the line, open the line, it's because they may be by that that area where the smoke is meeting that ventilation area and you're getting that vent point ignition. They're seeing the rollover starting from where the atmosphere is supporting it. And if you're just continue to crawl in underneath that, that black fire, it will bite you. Um, so if you hear somebody behind you screaming, open up the line, you better do so yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. No penciling. No, as Aaron Field says, erase that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> You know, we talk about flashover. I think every firefighter should study the double line of duty death in uh, Cherry Road in Washington, D.C. It's 1999. It's almost a quarter of a century ago. Killed wow. two career firefighters, um, and they each had a hose line in their hand. And, and as Shoup was saying, this fire, the Cherry Road fire, lit up so fast um, that they didn't have time to open a line. And it, it killed two and put another guy out with career ending burns. And uh, the third fella, um, the battalion chief outside didn't know anything was this bad going on inside. Not his fault. He couldn't see it. The, the place lit up and he didn't know it, it got that bad until the third firefighter stumbled out on fire. Um, so a couple of things we've learned about doing flashover training since 1996 is that a little bit of that dense smoke that's looking for fresh air to light up completely obscures your view. So as Jeff D was saying, you know, if somebody's telling you open the line, open the damn line because they're seeing stuff that, that you just can't see. Um, and again, that flashover now with, you know, we all know fires are burning faster. This is an example, um, uh, you know, of, of getting of the need to get water on the fire and decisive amounts of water on the fire. Groover just brought up a great point. I know he said it in jest, but it's true. Penciling. All right? No. People got to understand, when you're in, in, in heavy heat and smoke conditions, and again, think about the environment, the building, whatever it is you're in, and you open that, you open that now, you keep it open. You keep it full open. It's just, once again, we we keep saying, or I keep saying, it's just that simple. But that's survival at that point. And if if you are if you're in that situation and the water isn't doing its job of controlling that environment, you're down to your turnout gear to save your life or to protect you from serious burns at that point. And that's again why when we're going into a badass area. That's why we do what we do when we're going out there training and we're you know, going over door control and things like that. Check the door. What do you got on the other side of it and things like that? How to position that nozzle to extinguish <clears throat> and take control of that atmosphere as you move in. Because here we're talking about where guys are just barreling right in there without taking control of the atmosphere as they go in. And again, it lights up behind them. Now they're trapped between the, fu- the base of the fire and the exit that they just came in. So. And think about your turnout gear. What's been happening all the time you're moving in there? Your gear is getting saturated with heat. So when this thing lights up, now you're 
you know, you're saturated with heat. Now you're getting burned, just as Jeff said. And this penciling thing came from from across the pond, the Europeans. Yep. Um, some of those countries, they even get um, get charged if they do too much, if they do too much water damage. Uh, so the penciling thing, um, from what I saw, came from, you know, came from Europe. And when we bought our flashover trainer, they – trained us to do that penciling and it you know it controls the fire and it knocks it down but it just gives it the opportunity to come roaring back and bite you yeah so why not just open a nozzle and put it out okay i'm, I'm going to throw something out there and i just come across it recently it's been out there for a long time from europe gas cooling mm-hmm. gas cloud cooling and here again, they're going in with that narrow fog, opening and closing it, opening and closing it. That's to me, it, it's it's just well, I've got my I've got my opinions on it. I'll just hold my tongue right now. You guys want to weigh in this? Uh, weigh in on this? I one? think we all know your opinion, Jeff. You're right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, well, you know. But Jeff, I think what's more important is that system. That's a complete system. Those guys are trained to do it that way. You know, they move, they, they're trained to move it at a certain pace and, and that system works for them. And, and I think the American fire service, we, we pick the, the latest hot topic and try to stuff it into our system. And it just doesn't work that way. You know, it's just, if you got a system that works and it, it's a system. It's not just one part, you know, like there used to be this argument all the time. Do you use a smooth bore or do you use a fog? Well, right. that's part of it, but how much water are you flowing? What size hose you got? What's your nozzle technique? It's a, you know, again, we call it the fire tax system and it's not just, you know, you might as well ask what, how do you put your thumb over the butt to get, get a pattern? You know I mean? It's just crazy as that, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm sure this will come up in future debate. So, okay. All right. Don't oppose hose lines. The exterior line is always going to win. Those guys are outside. And when they, when that that uh, group on that exterior line get a, get an order from chief officer, sector officer, I don't care who, about protecting an exposure, well, then that's what they really should be protecting. But once they start putting the line into the fire building without knowing where fi- uh, a fire crew might be inside, uh, the guys inside always lose. Let's just put it that way. Okay. All right? Yep. Okay. First new engine should always look for its water source just in case the second new engine doesn't make it. I, w- I would like to think that as we go around and we, we work with fire departments across the country, that we're seeing fire departments with their first and second new engine pump operators collaborating to get a water supply established. Am I, am I correct in that assumption when we talk to people? That's what that's certainly the message we try to put out there, Jeff, but maybe some yeah. haven't heard it. Yeah, not yet. Okay. And that's especially important when you're talking smaller departments, you know, like for example, fire departments that run out of one station, uh, rural operations where you have an engine for this department, an engine for that department, it's going to be some time, but you need that help to get a water supply uh, guaranteed if you can do it, you know, so it should be those two guys to do it. But what if that second engine is held up or not able to respond to like it should, or gets into an accident or something like that. So, so again, I, I throw this one out there. Always look for your own water source going in. So what this does, this is where we say in our presentation, as you're on that engine and you turn the street corner into the street where the fire building is and you got it waiting down there at the end of the street for you, that's the time you slow down. Start looking for what you got. Are there wires down in the street? Is there an exposure building that's involved? Are people screaming out of an upstairs window or something like that? And look for your water source coming in. 
but do it slowing down so your guys on board can get a little bit, you know, control of themselves rather than just running up to the fire building, slamming on the brakes, and the guys run out of the cab and, and whatever. Okay? All right. People assigned to engines are stepping off. If people – let me start over, okay? If people assigned to engines are stepping off at the scene of a working fire, especially the first and second new engine companies with hooks and axes in their hands instead of doing engine work first, your fire department has organizational problems. Look, the engine is the only apparatus we have that's designed to fight the fire. Pump, hose, and water. The three basic things that make up an engine, okay? So if, especially, it's an obvious, honest to gosh, no bullshit, real fire, and your first engine guys are stepping off and running around the building, with tools breaking out windows and things like that. How does that help the situation? How does that make it better? Okay. And if the second uh, do engine comes, what is the primary duty of a second do engine? Anybody? Okay. Second line help with water supply. Yeah, there you go. So if they're going off and, 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 and I'm not saying that it's got to be hard and fast like that, because I do understand that, you know, there are times when you do need help venting and so forth. So maybe the first engine's got a line going in, they're operating off the tank. Well, the second pump operator can then go work with the first pump operator to work for a water supply. And maybe the guys on that second engine in the back step or whatever now have to do vent work or something. Like that. I understand there's those situations. So, but as a general rule, we need to see the first two pump operators in the scene, you know, work together to get water going. So that makes sense. Yep. Yes, sure does. Okay. All right. Sir, I had a young fireman ask me the other day. Um, he was always told to make sure he had a tool when he stepped off the engine. And I said, oh, well, yeah. if you're riding three seat and there's a fire, the nozzle is considered your tool. That is your tool. Just that simple. I've never seen a howling <laughs> and an axe put out a fire. That's right. <laughs> Very good. So, And how about if there's nothing showing and you're the first engine? Does he take a tool then or what does he take? Water can. There you go. If it says smoke or fire in the car in the alarm, smoke investigation, fire alarm. There's only one thing that fixes those if it's the real deal. Water. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I gotta I gotta throw something out there because it's something that I saw during during my years in the job, and that was you know, when guys are stepping off, I because I heard this from from a couple of young firefighters in a rotation they went to one company and they were told by the senior people or their boss whoever it was you always have a tool in your hand like one of you guys just said mm -hmm. and so as they move to another company or they're working in another company and they're taking that old mindset or what they were told to do even though they might be working on an engine now and they think they're going to do the same thing and that's engine work and it's not engine work engine work deals with water so there's where the boss has got to be the boss of the engine. You know, I don't care how many years you worked on a ladder company, a squad company, or whatever. Yeah, you did. You're an engine. You got to focus on engine work. All right. So, and you got to set the tone for the rest of the members on your engine. So, all right. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Number 22 more lives are saved by the proper placement and operations of hose lines than by all other life-saving techniques in firefighting. Jerry, who said this? <laughs> I think that's uh, Andy Frederick's uh, yeah. statement, isn't it? Yep. It might come – I know it comes from FDNY, and I know he had it out there. Yeah. You know, you know re real quick, what we're seeing um, – I'm in the suburbs of the city, and – we're seeing, well, it used to be single family dwellings. Uh, we were at one a couple of weeks ago, had three apartments in it, actually one in a basement, one on the first floor, one on the second floor, and it was a bedroom in the attic. So we're looking at the importance of getting water on the fire 
I don't want to say before we start to search, but we've had a couple instances where members have been trapped above uh, because we yeah. we had a hard time getting to the fire because it was doors blocked by furniture, uh, windows sheetrocked over, those kind of things. So we're we're kind of I don't want to say we're altering our tactics, but we're putting more emphasis on getting water on the fire uh, so we don't endanger our members uh, in the, in these in these death traps. So, okay, um, I don't want to belabor the point, but there again is where truck work might come in to complement the engine work. Mm-hmm. You know, and I understand that. You know, in fact, I think we talked about that the last episode. We, you know, when we had Arthur with us. So, mm-hmm. but this right here, more lives are saved by the by the proper placement and operation of hose line than by all other life saving techniques. And that's the thing about when you get in and you got that, you're up against it, it's full open. Just start working that whole area, work it with the nozzle and let it do its job. Hey, boss, you can also take this that more lives, if you're on the engine and you're in the nozzle, those lives also include the firefighters that are coming in with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you're now responsible for them as well. Right. Is there and and I think you guys can you know think about the fires that you've gone to, where firefighters are entering the building from different points, different levels. You know, like for example, if the nozzle goes in the front door and you got a good good fire there, smoky, it's hot, you're knocking the fire down. But you might have guys putting ladders up to the rear of the building, maybe, and going up to the second floor or wherever. And see, that's that thing about you know communication to the fire ground command, knowing where this, the people are and what they're doing. Jerry and John, Jeff, and, and Chad, do you deal with a lot of balloon frame construction down there? Not so much. Okay. Thank you. Where yeah. Where I'm going with this is that when you're dealing with that type of construction and fire gets in the walls, oh, my gosh, it can – it can run up here, run over there, run up there, and come back here. It's it's it can really create a very dangerous situation if we don't start getting that thing under control quickly. So, okay, let's move on. Know your water system. And just, just that's that's it. Know your volume, your flow rates, and the distances of your water sources. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Your first attack hose line should always be placed between the uh, should always be placed to protect life and or property from the threat of water when you can. Okay, when you can. I and again, there's times when you're not going to be able to do this. You're going to have so much fire on arrival. You're going to have a place that might have a, some people in there, and you got to go after the fire, and you won't have a, a chance to get between the people and the problem because you got a, that much fire. I get it, but this is a general principle right here. So, you okay with that? Yep. Yep. All That's right. It. Then I'll move on to the last one. <laughs> the drop point for the working length is generally the floor below the fire floor or outside of a ground floor or lower level fire. Okay. Does everybody follow that? Mm-hmm. Working length. As we said earlier, the last length packed on the hose bed, and you've got your nozzle and 50 feet of hose, and the person on the nozzle takes that to the drop point like you see here. So let's just say the fire is on the first floor. Well, then this is going to be where they drop the hose, and they're going to flake it out, make the call for water, go on air together. Okay? And bleed the line off and go after it. Okay. If it's an upstairs fire or a second floor fire, take the nozzle in to the base of the stairs, bring your line in, flake it out, do the same process there, bleed your line off, and you're going to be able to get your line up the stairway that way. Straight line. Don't throw your hose on the stairway because all you're going to do is create a trip hazard or you're going to kink the hose or something like that. Keep the hose down here, but take a straight line of hose up the stairway. 
easier to manage, by the way, for your guys too. And remember that thing we said about if you got a lot of fire up there, the guy can put a knee on it or pin it against the uh, wall or something like that to the stairs. So, all righty. That was pretty yep. good, Jeff. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. That's the 25 operating tips for engines. Well, I think it covered a lot of the principled uh, lessons that we go out and teach. Uh, and then it, we also had a chance to kind of go a little deeper on some of those slides. Uh, certainly a lot of, a lot of good takeaways for, for just the basics of engine company operations, but I think it also leads us more towards some of the subject that we can get deeper into if we had, you know, more time or we had some specific questions from, you know, those that may be watching this or listening to this. So. We're happy to do that. Just reach out to us at strategicfiretraining.com and uh, we can go into any one of those or all these slides deeper if you'd like. So keep us in mind when you want to do that. Yep, absolutely. I, I, I uh, uh, want to give a shout out to, uh, I think it's Adam McLean, right? From uh, Calgary. Yes, sir. And, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to him for contacting us. They were watching uh, him and his guys were watching our previous episodes. And you know, again, they have contacted us for some further information and so forth. So, yeah, feel free to get hold of us, guys. Hey, boss, uh, I, I uh, hey, I know, you know, I do this, this, you know, these 25 operating tips. If you've been a firefighter for a while, it may be common sense to you. But every time I get a new guy assigned to my station, we sit down at the table and we go over the 25 tips for the engine company. Um, and just because it's a good way to break the ice with a new firefighter on, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And I try to be very consistent and try to usually act on all these principles with everything I do. And it's, it's a great way to break the ice when you got a new guy or a new guy is being transferred into your station, going to be there for a while. Hey, most of my decisions, I use these 25 tips as how I operate. So that gets him on the page that I'm at and gets him thinking. And, it, and if he doesn't understand, it lets me know where I need to work with him at. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for a guy who's going to be with you. Yeah, you certainly want him. To I wouldn't do it on a one guy, a one day thing. But like when I moved stations, you know, the first thing I did was I pulled up 25 tips for the well, I had to cross out engine, but uh, um, why, I went, why is that? Because huh? it's a quint. It's an engine with a defensive capability. Um, and I crossed it out and I, you know, and, you know, like the letting the truck go first thing. I go, guys, that's where you have to listen. You have to know where our truck is. If our truck's coming, we need to pull past the house. But that brought out that talking point because, you know, most of the times we're acting as an engine. But it really kind of, and it took a lot of the questions and obscurity they had from me being their new officer down. And it gave us, you know, they, all, most of them knew the stuff, but it gave us good time to, Hey, let's, let's, uh, let's get this out before we get to a fire and need it. Yeah. I okay. saw it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> here. I am uh, trying to reach out to the fire service and somebody. It's else. a family show, Jeff. It's a family show. It's a family yeah. show. But PG thirteen, PG thirteen. I think it was every five miles on Interstate eighty going through Iowa. I saw that. Hey, I finally saw one in South Dakota. Oh yeah, going see, down. it's another they, 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 they butt Iowa, don't they, on the north? Yeah, I think so. What I wanted to say though, uh, Chad, you know, and I think Jeff brought it up uh, was that we t we take it for granted that people know this stuff. No, when we get out there, we find out that they don't. They've never been shown nozzle mechanics or things like that. The other thing that's surprising is is the number of places we go to where, you know, it's like here, here's your t-shirt, you know, here's your helmet, you know, your or your hat, and that's it. Show up for the calls. I mean, what the last two classes we've done, we've had people that have never had a nozzle in their hand. And, well, see, there's a point, you know. So, and I got to tell you, and Jer, this goes back many years ago. 
at FDIC, probably 2005, six, somewhere like that. And we had gotten done with doing hands-on at FDIC. And, you know, we always had a great group. And I thought, oh my gosh, we hit it out of the whole, hit it out of the park on both days of hot training. I thought for a short time there, that's it. We've got all this information on how to handle these hose lines and how you do it and what your pressures are and the whole nine yards for the fire service. And boy, I couldn't have been more wrong because it was just that we had some very excellent students who were in our classes back then and they just made it like boom, boom, boom. And then you find out like, as we travel now, you have states that have no standards for firefighter training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You come on a job, like we said, here's your ball cap, you know, and t-shirt and just show up and we'll tell you what to do when you get there. It's like, wow. You know, you just never know where that department is on that training spectrum. You know, are they, you know, yeah. are they really sharp or, yeah. you know, not so yeah. sharp, you know? Yeah. Anyway. So. Well, thanks no, for sharing this, uh, Jeff. This is, uh, I think, a real opportunity for a lot of people out there that haven't had a chance to take one of your classes and uh, to sit down here for a good hour and a half and, and kind of take in this experience and history-based information and, uh, you know, get shooped. It's a good way to get started. <laughs> I, I appreciate the compliments, but they also – uh all you guys we all say the same thing when we go out and do our our regular classes together as a group we're all talking the same and i i appreciate that <laughs> it is so great to you know be like that yeah so. well we only say it because we mean it too so okay. that's where we're all coming from yeah yeah that's what the team is all about too so that's something we might have to look at down the road is, you know, doing engine company leadership and fire department leadership and maybe fire ground leadership. What do you think? We, can we? Oh, boy. Can we, <laughs> Not all in one night. <laughs> no, that won't be a one-nighter. No. no. That could be, that could be yeah. a long class. Well, okay, we'll have to give the Reader's Digest version then. Well, Dietrich said to reach out, but our email is strategicfiretraining at gmail.com. So if y'all do have any questions, please let us know. Yep. All right. Until then, I guess we'll uh, see you guys on the training ground and uh, stay safe. Yeah. See you guys, everyone. Take care. Good night. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. IFSTA is dedicated to updating firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, apps, curriculum, resource one, and more. Our high-quality, technically accurate, and affordable training and education materials have made us a worldwide leader of the fire service. Visit us at ifsta.org for more information. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of Enforced Technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit TenkataFabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by Enforced Technology, only from Tenkata.